Good morning, church. How's everybody doing today? <laughs> hey, Monty. Sit down. <laughs> 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 Welcome here today. We're going to sing songs to God, about God. We're going to lift him up. We're going to sing songs to Jesus this morning. Uh, that's what we do here. So what I want to uh, stress is this last service, we had some tech, uh, technology issues. And so we didn't have any words whatsoever the whole service. So that was really interesting. But so we fixed it for you. So we want you to sing out. And worship, yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe. But we want you to sing out. So if you would go ahead and stand, we're going to sing Lion and the Lamb.
God bless you. God bless you. you Maybe seated. That is the truth. That is our heart's cry today. We want to pour out every bit of our being, every part of every breath that we have belongs to God, and may we make it our our goal today, our our life today, to give Him the praise that He deserves. Amen. God is good, and thank you so much for being with us today. want to just welcome you. If today's your first day, say thanks for being with us, and we're just glad you're here, and uh, we just want you to nestle in just perfect among this body who, who loves Jesus, who desires to, to know him with every part of our being and to make him known into this world, uh, to be that light. So God bless you again, and just thanks so much for being with us today. If you wouldn't mind, take out your bulletin. I have a few things I just want to highlight for you today. I uh, only have one insert. Today, is your uh, this is your sermon notes. Uh, for you, uh, an opportunity for you to take down and jot down what the Lord uh, just speaks to you through the time that we spend together today in the Word. We're looking at uh, a character called Benaiah. He's uh, especially a man of courage that we're going to look at in the Old Testament and uh, look forward to our time together with that. So keep this close to you if you would. Uh, not next week, but the week after, just want to give you a heads up. Uh, our, the, our homeless ministry down in downtown Phoenix, they're going to be going out again. I want to encourage you to be a part of that. So it's not next Sunday, but the Sunday following that uh, they'll be going, and uh, they'll be following the service here on Sunday morning. And I uh, would love for you to be a part of that, and it's a great opportunity. So I just want to keep that in front of you as well. Uh, also today, we have uh, a baby shower for one of the gals here in the church. Uh, her name is Taylor, and so we encourage you to be a part, ladies, and stick around. And uh, it's going to be a great time and celebration. They've already transformed the other room. It's already uh, all pink and girly and yeah, I'm not going in there just saying, but uh, but uh, it's going to be a good time. So I encourage you to, to be a part of that, and that will be today at 1 o'clock. So uh, that would be a good thing. And uh, you have something for the youth, you said, yes? Yes. So, uh, yes, we are going to have a pool party this week. Uh, so we'll meet here at the church at 6 o'clock, and then we'll walk over to the Carlson's, um, and we're going to do uh, a cookout, have some food, have some fun. Um, so, and this is for anyone who is going into grade six and uh, up through 12th grade. So if you know of anybody, please make sure that they're invited. No, Devin, I think you're outside that age range. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, but if you know of anybody, uh, make sure you let them know they're invited. Okay, perfect. All right, well, let's pray. Let's ask God's blessing, shall we, over our time together. Father, we love you and thank you. We look so forward to God for what you have for us today. Thank you that we can come to this place, gather in your name, without fear. And then, Father, that you've given us the ability to proclaim you, to learn, to grow in you. And, Father, we just ask that everything about this experience and moment together today would point us to you. Help us, God, to see the importance of courage and that you are the source of it. And, God, we're excited together today. God, we love you and thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I ask you to go ahead and stand. Greet each other today in the name of the Lord.
All right, as we turn to our seats, we're going to get uh, prepared for morning offering. church, I'm just going to ask that you uh, agree with me in prayer as we ask uh, God to bless this offering. Oh God, we're just so thankful uh, once again for having the opportunity to come here um, to be a part of your ministry, Father. We thank you uh, for the fact that we can have this relationship, Lord God, with you and what we want more than anything is what, and what you commanded us to do is go out and find others who don't know you. Lord Father, uh, one of the aspects of our worship is, is giving, Lord God, from the heart. And um, I just pray, Lord Father, that you'd use those monies uh, to help find those that don't know you. Lord God, that you, would, uh, that you would use it for your kingdom, Lord Father, that you would bless it, you would multiply it. We love you, we thank you. It's in your son's name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.
know, this next song we're going to sing is uh, Oceans. And uh, I wanted to mention to you, you know, if you guys get tired of standing, don't feel that you have to stand up all the time. You can take a seat and worship too. I think that's, if you can sit and talk, you can sit and sing. So <laughs> it works both ways. But the song Oceans, we're talking about uh, courage today and how uh, courage really affects our lives as Christians. And this this song, uh, listen to this uh, verse, uh, this is a verse two, your grace abounds in deepest waters, your, your sovereign hand will be my guide. Where feet may fail and fear surrounds me, you will never fail and you will never start now. See, God's track record is perfect. He's with us. He leans into us when we need that leaning. He holds us when we need holding. And, you know, when we take a step away, he remains still. <laughs> So I just want you to, to visualize this song as you sing it. It's beautiful lyrics, and it just gives God praise because that's he deserves it. There's, there's no one else here that deserves praise like Jesus deserves. Amen. Amen. Let me walk upon 
word would penetrate, Lord Father, those areas that maybe those things that some things that we are hiding. We just pray that, that we pray that you would expose those things in our life. Lord, I believe in the refiner's fire. I believe that you bring things to light and then you take them away. And then you find another thing of how we can grow in you. You bring it to light, whatever's getting in the way. I pray that today, Lord Father, in the name of Jesus. If there's anything distracting us as a church, if there's anybody out there right now who lacks courage, Lord Father, who, who's living in fear right now, Lord, I, I say I bind that in the name of Jesus because you do not give us the spirit of fear or timidity, but of love, power, and a sound mind. I'm just so thankful for that. We just pray that you would teach us today through your word, Lord God, and make it hit hard. Make it make a difference in our lives that not merely we just hear words going in our ears, but it affects us and we have to take action because of it. We love you. We commit this service to you. It's in your son's name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Kadaki Kadam shared a story that I want to share with you. There was a family of four, a nine-year-old daughter, Lisa, and a five-year-old son, Mark. Lisa was diagnosed with a, a rare blood disease and was predicted to die soon if the doctors didn't get the cure, which was some amount of blood matching their requirements uh, likely to be found in blood relatives. Now, upon testing uh, uh, the immediate family, basically it was found that young Mark, his, the five-year-old brother, that Mark's blood was a compatible match. And so Mark then was asked by his parents if he would be willing uh, to agree to give Lisa uh, some of his blood. Now, Mark asked, now, will it save Lisa? And when they said yes, he agreed. Two days later, the blood transfusion began, and Mark was put on the table and on that bed that was right next to where Lisa was as the blood began to be extracted. Now, after some time, Mark started to feel dizzy, and that's when he asked the doctors if this is the time that he would start dying. The doctors were a bit amazed, and it later clicked to them that Mark never knew the amount of blood required to cure Lisa. He thought all of his blood was needed, and yet he still agreed to it. I don't know about you, but to me, that's a pretty remarkable young man, and you talk about courage, to not have a clue, thinking that he was giving all of his blood away. I mean, that's hard to believe from a five-year-old. Now, John Wayne stated wisely, courage is being scared to death, but saddling up anyway. Precisely what, in my opinion, what young Mark did. He, in the face of what he didn't know, he did it anyway. Any moments of courage like that for you? Any moments where it had to rise within, where you were scared, but you saddled up anyway? Have you ever had moments like that where it just took some incredible amounts of courage? Courage, I believe, I do believe, that it is something that God gives us in moments of great difficulty and fear and situations that really are beyond our control in that moment. Now, as we are going to examine here some of the traits, and we've been looking at the men and women of the Bible. We've been trying to glean and learn from, from the character that we see displayed in the, in the pages of Scripture and, and how we can apply it and how we can, in our own lives, grow and mature in our faith. Now, so far, we've looked at Esther. We've looked at Rahab last week. And today, today we're going to look at a man named Benaiah and how he was a man of courage who served King David. He's an obscure character. You don't hear much about him. But I tell you, nonetheless... He's a very important figure. He's got a lot of great things that we can learn. And ultimately, by his example, we can serve King Jesus with great courage by placing our entire full trust in him. Now, looking at our society, looking at the day in which we live. We live in a day and age where to be a Christ follower, that is someone who loves God fully and upholds his word, 
even in those things that society finds offensive, it many times is met with hostility. In many times it's met with anger. In many times it's met with judgment. And at times can cost us things. It can cost us friendships. It can cost us jobs. It can cost us businesses and or even slandering our name and our reputation. Which we're also not far off, ultimately, from the persecution that's, that's coming. Persecution is definitely coming as well. Now, Jesus spoke of this. This isn't anything new. A lot of times I feel, I don't know if you agree with me or not, but a lot of times it feels like we go through things and it's like we're the only ones in the world or, or this is the only time that it's happened or, or things like that. Well, this isn't the only time. Jesus spoke of these very things. He gave us uh, his insight during his ministry, reminding those who belonged to him. In fact, turn with me in your Bibles. I want you to see John chapter 15. That is the Gospel of John chapter 15. We're going to look at verses 18 through 25. So if you didn't bring a Bible, there's one located in front of you under the seat in front of you. But I encourage you, grab your word, take a look. John 15, we're going to look at verses 18 through 25. Gospel of John, chapter 15. We're going to look at verses 18 through 25. I'm going to read to you out of the New Living Translation. This is what Jesus says, beginning in verse 18. He says, If the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. The world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it, but you are no longer part of the world. I, I chose you to come out of the world so it hates you. Do you remember what I told you? A slave is not greater than the master. And since they persecuted me, naturally they will persecute you. And if they had listened to me, they would listen to you. They will do all this to you because of me, for they have rejected the one who sent me. They would not be guilty if I had not come and spoken to them, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Anyone who hates me also hates my Father. If I hadn't done such miraculous signs among them that no one else could do, they would not be guilty, but as it is, they have seen everything I did, yet they still hate me and my Father. This fulfills what is written in their scriptures. They hated me without cause. So again, this goes all the way back to Jesus. It shouldn't be any surprise. It shouldn't be any surprise regarding the world in which we live and, and these very, very things that, again, as they hated him, they hate us, for those of us who are in Christ. It's part of it. We need to, again, not necessarily resolve to it and just kind of just say, well, that's the way it is, but to have an understanding that this, this isn't something unique just to us in this day and age. To be a Christ follower, courage ultimately is a must. So then what then can we learn from Benaiah? Now it's your time to jump in the Old Testament. We're going to 2 Samuel. We're going to be in chapter 23 of 2 Samuel. Uh, that's, uh, again, after Kings. Uh, take a look there. It's right there. So Joshua, Judges, Ruth, Kings, it's all right in that area. Second Samuel chapter 23, and we're going to look at verses 20 and 21. So if you want to take out your notes, now's the time to, to jot some ideas and thoughts as the Lord moves upon your heart today. But the courage modeled breeds more. Courage modeled breeds more. That's our first point today. So let's look at the Word of God 2 Samuel chapter 23, beginning verse 20. This is what it says. It says, Then Benaiah, the son of Jehida, the son of a valiant man of Kabzeel, who had done mighty deeds, killed the two sons of Ariel of Moab. He also went down and killed a lion in the middle of a pit on a snowy day. He killed an Egyptian, an impressive man, and now the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, but he went down to him with a club and snatched that spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. Now, at first sight, I don't know about you, but this sounds like a scene from Braveheart, Rambo, and the Patriot all kind of jammed together. Yes? Doesn't it kind of gives you that mindset? When I was preparing for this, I go, man, that totally sounds like a movie. All right, it's kind of like all rolled together. So, so what is this passage trying to communicate? What, what is it really trying to show us today? Well, ultimately, I think the last half of this 
uh, this passage tends to be what makes the greatest impression on it. I mean, it sounds pretty impressive, all these deeds that he had done. But see, the most important part of it, though, we missed. We just kind of glanced over it. Look at verse 20, at the very beginning of verse 20. It says, Then Benaiah, the son of Jehida, the son of a valiant man of Kabzeel, who had done mighty deeds. So what we find here contextually, we find ourselves in a passage describing the mighty men of King David. Now, if you go back earlier in the part of uh, 2 Samuel 23, go back to verse 1, it kind of unfolds this this account, this description of the mighty men of King David who were employed in his service. This was like the elite of elites, okay? And, and, and this list was put together, and then we find that, again, in this passage, it's listed with and riddled with just a whole bunch of mightiest warriors. And, and, and really what it's about, <clears throat> it's kind of like the idea of elite squads of strong and very fierce men in service to the king. Kind of today, like you kind of think along our special forces in our military, okay? It's kind of that idea. And Benaiah, he is one of such that is in this list of men that we find him. And there's very, very little, but there's a lot we can learn. Benaiah was the son of Jehida, and Jehida was the son of a valiant man of Kebzeel. Now, this picture, what we have here, is really of generationally, there, there's great and mighty men in this line. Okay, so it's grandfather, it's father, and now it's Benaiah. Jehida was a priest, that much we know. In fact, uh, he was one of David's heroes, helped to rally 3,700 men against some sort of uprising that took place. I mean, he was part of it. He was, he was a priest unto God and in service to David. Uh, the grandfather from Kabzeel, we don't, we don't know much more than he was valiant. We just know because it's, a, again, mentioned in terms of that line and legacy. And nonetheless, Benaiah had great examples within his life. In fact, you know, this culture was very, very oral and tradition and the way that they would spend a lot of time sharing stories and, and giving reminders and, and, again, sharing these things in, in this oral tradition and and I'm sure that they were sitting around, and I'm sure Benaiah was, was privy to all the old stories of the days of old, of hearing the, the, the exploits of grandfather and, and, of course, his dad and the various things. I'm sure that, again, seeing the old days in courage that were displayed was part of something that he, he received. And, and to see this model in action, what it does is it breeds more. When you can see it, it hen- tends to influence now, I know in my own life, God knew the importance of breaking the divorce chain in my family line. Okay, my father, his three brothers, my grandfather, every one of them have been divorced. Okay, and this isn't meant to slam. Don't take it this way. But I just know for me, God knew he wanted to make a chain break in my life, in, in my family line. And so I look at this as that's one of the reasons why God had my family place me at Sunshine Acres Children's Home to live for eight and a half years of my life starting at age 12. God knew that I need to be plucked out of the middle, brought to someplace different, and to have a living, breathing example of a husband and wife who can love each other, who can fight with each other, but who can stay committed and connected to one another. And, and my house parents who raised me, uh, to this day, they're, they're over 50, almost 55 years married this year. See, God knew I needed to see that. I had to have that example in my own life. My own family, my own blood mother and father made three months shy of 11 years married before they divorced when I was a kid. And to God's praise and to God's glory, June 1st, my wife and I celebrated our 28th anniversary. And that's, that's God. That's totally God. And I give him the glory for that. I do. But it's, again, seeing, emulating those who are in front of you, those who you see, those who you are able to observe. That's how things change and how, how it breeds more in terms of that understanding uh, in terms of our own life. Now, I'm sure all that Benaniah, or the Benaiah rather, saw, it influenced his courage as well. I'm sure hearing the stories but also observing things 
with his own eyes. And, and many, of course, many mighty deeds were done here. It says that he killed two lion-like men, two sons of Ariel uh, that, that you might see in your scripture, or, or those of, from Moab. That's what it's talking about, these two lion-like men, meaning that these guys that, that, that Benaiah went against were, I mean, they were strong and just fierce guys, nothing to be messed with or be uh, tri, you know, trivial with, absolutely was able to overcome them. And this, he also killed a lion. I mean, that's, it's insane to think you want to jump in a snowy pit and take out a lion, but that's what this guy did. And, and, and it's very interesting. It's very similar to King David. David, when the sheep was, uh, he was out being uh, with the sheep and hanging out with them, again, had, had animals come and attack, and, and he with his bare hands went after. So it's interesting to me that as Benaiah killed a lion, and so as King David kill, killed a lion when he was younger, it's no wonder that King David ends up placing Benaiah as the, 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 the head over the king's bodyguard. It's interesting to me. We see that he's, this guy's fearless. This is what we see consistently here. And it says also that he killed an Egyptian champion. And what it, your word might say, it might not, if you dig a little bit, what we discover is that this was, a, was a, just a huge man that he went up against. And not quite as Goliath big, but everybody says way over seven feet tall, this guy. In fact, do you know uh, uh, what, what, a, what a weaver's loom is? In the old days when they would make it and make rugs and tapestries and things, if you've ever seen one, I've seen one up close when I went to North Africa. They're huge. They're big. They're really big. Well, the top part is the weaver's needle, and that's what goes across, you know, in terms of what they utilize. And, and it says that this man's spear was as large as a weaver's needle. And that's what he ended up taking away. He actually showed up with a club, and he had a huge spear, and of course... It says Benaiah took that spear from him and ended up taking him out with his own. So this to me gives greater credence to words are cheap. And I know in my house, action is where it's at. And that's what we see. The truth is there is unimaginable power in living such a way that it positively shapes the legacy that follows. There's unimaginable power in that. I mean, trajectory of life can change when we see positive things that are lived in such a way. Courage, integrity, honor, being moral, be upright, be God-fearing. All of these can and will influence and breed more for generations to follow. So, second point today, courage brings honor. Let's look at verses 22 and 23. This is what it says. These things, these things Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, did and had a name as well as the three mighty men. He was honored among the thirty, but he did not attain to the three. And David appointed him over his guard. Courage was evident and seen ultimately by King David and those around Benaiah. I mean, his honor was great. He lived in such a way that it basically shared who he was. Do you know somebody like that? Have you had somebody in your life where, man, you've, you've observed them from a distance, and, and it, they're so consistent with who they are? You know what I'm saying? That it just, it's one of those things where it's almost as if their reputation precedes them, and then when you do finally meet them, you go, yeah, absolutely, that's, that's 100% who you are. That, I think with all my heart, that's really the kind of guy that Benaiah was. His honor was great, and, and he was named among the mighty men of King David. Now, he had some incredible honor bestowed upon him because of the way that he lived. He was placed in charge of, of, David, of King David's bodyguard. He was placed as commander of David's mercenary forces. In other words, there were some little elite squads of men that were known for just being absolutely fierce. And he was the commander of those guys. He also helped make King Solomon king. He was part of the party that got uh, Solomon to his coronation uh, when Absalom tried to overthrow and usurp the throne. And so we see that taking place. And then it goes on even further after King Solomon becomes king and Benaiah is tied to, to the helping him do so. He then, by King Solomon, is placed as the general over the entire army of Israel. And so he replaced Joab, as we see 
uh, in terms of, of taking that position. There were many, many, many wonderful opportunities came to Benaiah for how he lived with courage to do, to face, and ultimately to overcome that which wasn't easy. But operating in such a way in love and devotion to God and to King David. He, he knew very clearly he loved God. He was, he was the type that loved God with all his heart, soul, strength, and mind, and, and he loved his king. And we see that evidenced in the life in which he lived. Great honor came to him, and forever he is cataloged in the Scriptures for an example for us to follow. Now, you and I, obviously, we're not the king's bodyguards, no. And, and we're not leading some sort of elite squad or, or, or commando group, okay? But yet, I'll tell you what, it takes courage, courage to live in this world today within your life. It's still great and in need. Would you agree with me this morning? We need it. We need courage. Courage is something that's necessary for us as people, especially for those of us in Christ, those who, who, who love Jesus with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. So in what ways, in what ways are we in need of courage then? If that's the case, and it says we're in need, and, and, and we're all in agreement in this, in what ways then do we need courage? Now, on your pages here, I've given it to you, it's on the back side. Uh, there's some place for you to jot some notes. Now, well, what are some areas in our lives that we need courage? Well, first of all, we need courage spiritually. Spiritually. What do I mean by that? I mean to be able to stand strong in our faith. Stand strong in our faith in today's day and age and to not compromise. To not give in. To not water down the truth of the gospel for the sake of being politically correct. Now, I, I've told you, I've gone on record, I've said it, I mean it. I'm not politically correct anymore. I, I, I'm, I'm going to be loving, I'm going to be very, very caring and very, very compassionate but I don't know about you, but I, I'm tired of, of counting down to being politically correct. I mean, I, I'm sorry. I, I just am. But we, we can't water down the gospel. We can't water down the truth just because it's not politically correct. But we need a courage spiritually to be a witness and to be a testimony with everyone that God brings past us. It's not always easy. I mean, there's opportunities that are presented to us all the time. And, 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 you know, the best information that we could ever do would be to give someone in that moment of need where we know that, you know what I'm talking about, right? Has, have you had those moments where, where, you, where you're getting that nudge on the heart, do I, do I not, do I, do I not? It's like almost like you're arguing with yourself, you know, in those moments. Should I, should I not, should I, should I not? No, we, we got to be bold in that. We need that courage to say, hey, even, even to begin a spiritual conversation, I, I will tell you, I will tell you the truth. If you do it in a manner that is very loving and very caring and you're coming from that perspective, I have yet for someone to be offended to me or at me for doing so. Okay? It's not manipulating the situation or the conversation, but if you come from a heart of love and genuine concern. Now, they may not agree with you, and they might say, well, hey, thank you very much, but I'm not interested, and, and that's fine. That's cool. But I tell you, there's been a lot of times a lot of really good conversation has come by just being willing to take that first step and to take the courage to do so. So again, an another way spiritually we need courage is to not recant or become a chameleon. It is so easy today just to kind of bail, to bail out, to kind of soft pedal things and, and, to, and to kind of back up a little bit, or to be a chameleon, that is to, to blend in with the surroundings around you. Now, there's a reason why God says, be the light in the world, in the world that's filled with darkness. So we're to shine. We're to be like that city that's set on a hill. We're to be there like that light on a lampstand. I mean, our, our, our life is to reflect the light of Jesus, and we need courage to do that spiritually. We also need courage morally. To stand firm on biblically right convictions, again, though even society doesn't necessarily agree. We don't have to club people with the word. We don't. And honestly, we can disagree agreeably. We don't have to be at that place where, where we're just clubbing people to death. I've, I've tried very hard to, and it's interesting, my younger years, my younger life, you know, in the Lord, I was, I was very zealous. I was very narrow uh, probably even honestly, if I, if I confess before you, probably judgmental, 
You know what I'm saying? Where I would kind of pick things apart, you know what I mean, and, and point things out. Well, you know what? Not that I've compromised on the convictions biblically, no. But I think and believe that God has helped me to say, you know what? There's only one true judge who is non-biased, and it's not me. It's God and God alone. And that's his job, not my job, okay? My job's not to judge. And so God has softened my heart and, and made room to say, okay, we can disagree. But, you know, here's the thing. I don't have to compromise. And, and you, if you have that opinion or thought about life, okay, we can still do that as long as I do so in a manner that shows love and compassion and concern. There's also morally we need courage to, to not allow situational ethics and to allow that into our lives, meaning whatever fits is becoming relative in that moment. No, we need to have integrity. Integrity is huge. And we need to make sure that we have the courage to do so. We also need the courage to live and to do right simply because it's right. Because it's right. The third thing we need courage in is emotionally. Emotionally, we need courage. Why? Because we need to face the things within us, no matter how painful, no matter how far we've buried it, to resolve all the obstacles to freedom that God wants within us. Church, I hope you hear this today. God wants you free. He wants you free, free from everything that holds you back, free from every bit of pain and shame and guilt and pain and trauma and drama, all this stuff that just gets in the way. I don't know about you, I'm 49 years old, and God is still pulling stuff up. I'm like, seriously, I thought I was done with some of this stuff, right? You ever get like that? You ever feel like that? You hope like that? What I'm finding is there's, there's these things that just keep kind of popping up, creeping up, and I'm like, okay. And, and, and you know, I've got to deal with them. I do. Because God has already set us free from the shackles of sin. We're no longer under that. Okay? And God wants us to operate in freedom. Freedom to be exactly who he's created us to be. But we need the courage to do so because I tell you what, it's not always easy, is it? It's not always easy to take a look within and face those things that we need to deal with. Emotionally, we need courage to ensure that the fruit of the Spirit is living and growing within us. Do you know what the end result of the fruit is? It's, it's leading to a self-controlled life. I love what the fruit of the Spirit is. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. We need that in our lives. And it takes courage to do it, to live it, to apply it, to allow God to transform us in that way. So emotionally, yes, we need courage. Finally, the fourth is socially. Socially, again, we need to stand firm in our faith. We need to not waver. We need to be light in the darkness, in the days that are evil. We need to point others to Christ and be that beacon, that conduit that gives you know, again, the direction to say, hey, this is, this is where hope is truly found. This is where peace is truly found. It's not in things or stuff or power or whatever that the world trappings might be, but it's in him. And as far as we can socially to have the courage, we need to be at peace with all men as far as you can without personal compromise. So now all of these areas, all of these areas require a great deal of courage. And the source for the Christ follower, it comes not from within us, not within our flesh, not within our own abilities, not within our own strength. We, we, we can't look to us. How many of you have tried and, and succeeded? Yeah, not, not, not too often, right? Maybe, maybe we, get, we get in those moments, yes, and we do look at ourselves. We look to ourselves, we do, and, and we try, and the next thing you know, we're spitting gravel out, Yes? You know, God says, listen, I want to be your strength. I want to be the one who helps you. I want to be the one who guides you. And ultimately, we need to look to him for it in that way. He's, us, our flesh, our strength, our talents, that's not the source of it. No, true courage, true courage comes by the power of Christ mightily at work within you, within your life, within God's spirit guiding you. If you want the true source of it, of the true source of courage, that's where you got to go. you got to look to him and the power that he has working within us. Now, there are countless scriptures, countless scriptures of God's voice that is cheering us on, that is supporting us, that is encouraging us. Again, I love that word, encourage. It means with courage. It should, should by the result of it, should give us courage, okay, to be able to send us on our way for every Christ follower, okay, to courage and to trust in him. 
And, and truthfully, courage comes from a profound trust in Christ as the source of all things that we need to live. Now, on your notes, I've given you all the scriptures that I'm going to read to you right now. And, and these are important. I want you to look them up. Look them up throughout this week. Because I'm guaranteeing you it's not a matter of if you need courage. It's a matter of when you need courage. And these could be a great means of help for you. So first of all, when do we need courage? When we all face fearful moments or battles. Listen to what 2 Chronicles 20, 15b says. It says, thus says the Lord to you, do not fear or be dismayed because of this great multitude. Or maybe it's this great issue that's in front of you. For the battle is not yours, but God's. See, the thing about it is, don't freak out in those moments that, are, that are, seem overwhelming. God says, and, and how, let me ask you, how many times have you felt like that you're going through stuff and it's just you and you alone and no one else has faced it? No one else has endured it. I mean, it feels like that in the moment, right? I, I believe with all my heart the enemy just lies, 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 lies to us and tries to get us to, to feel or think that we are somehow isolated off, uh, disconnected from everything and everyone. And that's not the truth. God says, listen, don't, be fear, don't, don't, don't fear or be dismayed because of what you're going through. The battle is not yours, but God's. Deuteronomy 31.6 says, be strong, be courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble at them, for the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Do you know that is such a huge promise? Isn't it wonderful to know that God never says, I'm done. Never says, I'm pulling out. Never, I'm, I'm, I'm done with you. He, he, hey, work this one out on your own. He's not ever doing any of that. He never leaves, no forsakes. He will not fail. He's faithful in that. And we can trust in that. 100% of the time, trust in that. And that's so huge. So when you, we fa face these fearful moments or battles, great scripture. Uh, the next part is when you lose sight of serving God and purpose in it. In it. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, listen to what this says. It says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, that is, be strong, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil, okay, is not in vain in the Lord. Meaning that the things that you're doing, the way that you're serving, the way that you're living, it's not in vain. It's not in vain. Be steadfast and be immovable, always abounding in this way. Ephesians 6.10 says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Why? Because he, he alone is our true source of power and strength to continue and to be courageous. Now, here's the thing about this word, guys. I mean, it's important. Uh, when we look at this, Corinthians, Ephesians, and of course, my personal favorite, 2 Timothy 1.7 says this, that for God has not given you a spirit of timidity, that is, that, that you become sheepish, okay, kind of, you know, hesitant, okay? He doesn't give you a spirit of timidity or fear, but of power and love and a sound mind, one that we can absolutely use, that verse, to defeat fear and to be courageous in, in Christ. We, we, can, we can do this no matter what we face. Ultimately, live truth is a powerful, powerful living. Now, the part about it that we have to remember is that these words, these scriptures, they need to be spoken. You understand? Spoken word, not in your head and your mind, right? All right? Because, it, it, yes, God can read your thoughts. Satan cannot. That is one thing that's uh, of many that are different. Satan can't read your mind. Only God can, yes. But there is power when we speak that word. In fact, we have the example of Jesus himself when he was in the, in the wilderness being tempted Okay, what happened? The enemy came to him, talked to him, presented this temptation, laid it before him, spoke it to him, and of course, what did Jesus do in return? Jesus said, as it's written, bam, he would speak that written, written word. And what took place? End of temptation, on to the next. You understand? So when it comes to these moments and these words and these scriptures and these promises that we have, you literally need to speak them out. And I will tell you that that verse alone, as I've shared many, many times before, 2 Timothy 1.7 has been a great anchor for me in many things. It's helped me to overcome many things because I'm speaking it out loud in those moments when I feel fearful, when I'm shaken a little bit, when I'm afraid, when I'm hesitant to speak that word and to say, God, you 
have not given me a spirit of fear or of timidity, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And in Jesus' name, I claim that. So I'm feeling afraid. I rebuke you, fear. You're not from God. You're from the enemy. And I'm not going to accept it. I shut it down right there. And I'll tell you what, every single time I've done that, every single time, God has shown up and been so faithful. And, but there's one caveat to that. When you speak the word, you have to follow it with taking that step. You understand what I'm saying? You don't want to be sheepish and call it out but not do anything with it. No, you take that step forward in faith claiming that. Psalm 31, 24 says, Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who hope in the Lord. See, he's, he's so good. God is good, right? God is good into, to us in so many ways. Thank, thank him so much for how he just he gives us everything that we need. So as we wrap this up today, the only way to stay strong, the only way to stay courageous in what we need spiritually and morally and, and emotionally and socially, it will only happen if our hope and our trust is in the Lord completely, in his power, in his word, in his spirit, and in his guiding. To learn from Benaiah, a courageous man who served King David, I mean, courage will be ours if our full trust is in Christ. We need to rest in that where he is the first and the very last on our hearts and our minds every day. He's who we begin with and who we end the day with. We give him that kind of space. God starts doing awesome things. And that's when we start to see our, our very life, uh, you know, again, become very courageous. It doesn't mean that we're not going to have struggles or trials or things that are going to come at us, okay? But what it's going to do, it's going gonna, it's gonna to minimize a lot of its, uh, of its power, and, and you're going to find that because of the trust that you have in the Lord, that you're going to be able to, to be very victorious and to be very courageous in those moments. His word and worship and prayer and priorities, they, they, they become a higher value so as to connect with Christ as source of all the power that we have within. Now, this ultimately is kind of an if-then statement. If this is you. Okay? If this is you, then courage will be yours in every arena that you need it, spiritually, morally, emotionally, and socially. And God gives courage and he gives strength and hope to live this life to all who look to him. Ultimately, live in this way to trust in Christ, it will become second nature. It, it will just naturally become part of who you are. You'll be transformed in it. And it will be very fulfilling and it will be an adventure like absolutely no other. So my encouragement to you today, my, my exhortation to you today, my imploring you today, is would you let the adventure begin? Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for Benaiah. Thank you for the example that we have in Scripture of, God, men and women that are such as these that God, you've done great and mighty things through. Father, we just ask in Jesus' name today for hope. We ask for courage. We ask for trust. God, I speak that over this body today. I speak a release. I speak freedom. God, I speak a spirit of adoption to those who don't know you. I ask, God, that you would work mightily in our hearts, mightily in our minds. Help each one of us, God, to, to trust you in greater fashion. And then, Father, the result of it, God, may you give us the courage that we need to live in each and every arena of life. God, we want to be a beacon of light and hope to others. Father, we want to experience and walk in truth. And so, God, we ask that you would do what only you can do in us. And may you receive the honor and the glory and the praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen, hallelujah. Please, if you would, stand as we have our closing song today.
church this week. Go out and encourage. Live you do the journey, the fight. You know, sometimes I think uh, worshiping gives me the strength that I need to make it through the day. So I pray that over you today. This we want you to do. So go and be blessed. You're dismissed.